He created the universe To him belong the heavens and the earth The ever-living, he is the first He's the owner of mercy He sent his messengers To warn his creatures Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh my dear brothers and sisters and dear viewers, we will continue, inshallah, chapter one. Also, the author, rahimahullah, quoted a hadith, and this hadith is weak. Okay, now, you see, the hadith of the Prophet, sallam, first of all, we Muslims, alhamdulillah, we are the only nation on the face of the globe that has this unbroken chain of narrators and broken chain of narrators from the muhaddith to the Prophet ﷺ. You know the chain? One chain, many rings together. The top of the chain is the Prophet ﷺ. The second ring, the companion, Sahabi. Third ring, Tabi'i. Fourth, Tabi'i Tabi'i. So all the rings, they are one into the other. This is called Isnad. Called what? It's not the chain of narrators and broken. Because if one ring is missing, there is a gap. Are you following? No one has this. If we ask the Jews, any Jew, Rabbi, say, can you give us unbroken chain of narrators till you reach Musa, Ali Salam, Moses? They don't have it. If we ask the Pope himself, can you give us unbroken chain? Till you reach Jesus Christ, they don't have it. Ask the Muslims. Today, there are many scholars, they have the Isnad. And he will give you the Isnad till he reaches the Prophet This is how Allah protected the deen and protected the sunnah of the Prophet And we know every narrator when he was born, when he died. How about his memory? How about his piety? How everything. They are encyclopedias. This is the science of hadith. Reliable narrators, weak narrators, liars, kadhabin, different encyclopedias. This is how Allah protected the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. The hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, this is how we, we check whether this hadith is authentic or not. There's a science behind it, through the isnad. That's why they said the isnad is part of the deen. Because without Isnad, you can't say anything. But with the Isnad, you cannot lie. There are liars, there are fabricators, there are many fabricated hadiths. But the scholars, they knew them, and they classified them in special books. This hadith is a lie. Are you following? Now, the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, the scholars categorize it into two main categories, traceable hadith and untraceable hadith. Untraceable, that means something happened in the chain. The traceable, two types, Sahih and Hassan. The untraceable, the weak, the mawdu, the fabricated, the mursal, there are many types, okay? Now, this hadith, the author is quoting, it is in Tirmidhi, and it is weak hadith. Why weak hadith? There is defect in one of the narrators. The question is, why would an author mention a weak hadith in his book? For instance, why did Imam Tirmidhi mention it in his book? Are you following? Okay. The books of hadith, some books, like Sahih Imam Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, they're called Sahih, means authentic. Because the author himself, like Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim, they put a condition and they stipulated that they were not mentioned in their books except the Sahih hadith. Whereas the books of Sunan, like Tirmidhi, Nasa'i, Ibn Majah, Abu Dawood, they didn't put this condition. So they mentioned the Sahih Hadith, and sometimes Hassan, and the Hassan, and sometimes the weak Hadith, and they will tell you it is weak. They will mention that this Hadith is weak. So why you put it then? Oh, there is a reason. Sometimes maybe this weak Hadith, the defect in the Isnad because of one of the narrators, but because his memory is not that sharp. That is the reason. So we cannot accept it because of this defect. The defect is not very severe. Now we keep this hadith. 
hoping maybe you will find another isnad, another chain of narrators mentioning the same hadith. See, you have two, this hadith, and you have two isnad. This hadith from Abu Hurairah, this hadith from Ibn Umar. Are you following? Now, maybe this hadith coming from Abu Hurairah, there is in the isnad, there is a slight defect in one of the narrators. Then we found another, the same hadith, same text from Ibn Umar in this reporting, and also in the Isnad, also a slight defect. But the hadith is the same. So the scholars, they put the two Isnads together, and the hadith can become a little bit stronger and become Hassan. The hadith will be strengthened and become Hassan hadith, because the defect in both Isnads is not that severe, and both are mentioning this hadith. So the probability that this hadith is said by the Prophet ﷺ is high. Are you following? So for that reason, a muhaddith will mention the hadith because maybe this hadith will come across other isnad. Then the scholars who come after him, they can use that hadith and as Hassan hadith. That's one thing. The second benefit, he's telling you this hadith is weak. So if there is no other isnad except this one, I am telling you don't waste your time. It is weak. So he's saving your own time. Are you following? Is this clear? Now, the author mentioned this hadith, which is in Tirmidhi, and the isnad is Dawood al-Audi. So there is a slight defect in the isnad. The hadith says, Man arada an yandura, that Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu said, Man arada an yandura ila wasiyyati Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, التي عليها خاتمه فليقرا قوله تعالى قل تعالوا اتل ما حرم ربكم عليكم الا تشركوا به شيئا الى قوله وان هذا صراط مستقيم ابن مسعود said whoever wishes to ascertain to ascertain the very will the very will of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam on which the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has put his seal let him read the statement of allah say oh muhammad وسلم, come i will recite what your lord has prohibited you from join not anything in worship with him up to and verily this is my straight path which is the ayat we just mentioned so ibn mas'ud is saying this is the wasiya this is the will from the prophet وسلم, in which he put his seal so if you want to read the will of the Prophet Sallallahu read the previous ayat. Then the author Rahimahullah mentioned authentic hadith in Bukhari in the book of Jihad. It's narrated that Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu said, Kuntu radif al-Nabiyyi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala himarin faqala li, ya Mu'adh, atadri mahaqullah ala al-ibad? وَمَا حَقُّ الْعِبَادِ عَلَى اللَّهِ قُلْتُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَعْلَمُ قال حق الله على العباد أن يعبدوه ولا يشركوا به شيئا وحق العباد على الله أن لا يعذب من لا يشرك به شيئا قلت يا رسول الله أفلا أبشر الناس قال لا تبشرهم فيتكلوا معاد saying I was riding behind the Prophet ﷺ on a donkey and he said to me, Oh Mu'ad, do you know what is the right of Allah on his slaves, servants? And what is the right of the servants, the slaves upon Allah? I responded, Allah and his messenger know best. He continued, the right of Allah upon his slaves is to worship him alone and never to associate anything with him. The right of slaves upon him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is not to punish any person who does not associate a thing with him. I said, O oh Allah's messenger, may I not give the glad tidings to the people? He replied, no, do not inform them lest they rely on the promise 
they rely on the promise and lapse in their service to him. Now this beautiful hadith, the hadith of Mu'adh, he was riding behind the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ was riding a donkey, Mu'adh behind him. Then he turned and looked at Mu'adh and he said, Oh Mu'adh, do you know Allah's rights? The right of Allah on us? He said, Allah and his messenger know best. I don't know. Teach me. He said, Allah's right on us as slaves and servants of Allah is to worship him alone without associating any part. And our rights on Allah is that he will not punish anyone who died without associating any partner. If you die without committing shirk, Allah will not punish you. And this is the merit and the virtue of Tawheed. This is a good news, right? Isn't it? Very good news. So that's why Mu'ad said, shall I inform the people, the Sahaba, the Muslims? Don't inform them. Lest they rely on the promise, because maybe they will rely on the promise and they not work, and lapse, become lazy in worshipping Allah. The question is, if the Prophet ﷺ told Mu'ad not to mention it, how did it reach us? How did it reach us when the Prophet ﷺ told him not to mention it? Mu'ad mentioned this only when he was dying. When he was dying, he mentioned this because he didn't want to die while hiding the knowledge. Dear brothers and dear sisters and dear viewers, stay tuned. We'll be back, inshallah, after a short break. Welcome back, my dear brothers and sisters and dear viewers. We were discussing before the break, there's a similar to another hadith in Sahih Muslim, that one day the Prophet ﷺ was sitting with the Sahaba, and all of a sudden he disappeared. And the Sahaba, they got worried. And they started looking for him. And Abu Huraira said, I went to a farm of the Ansar. And I looked for the door. There was no door. And there was a small stream of water going into the field, the farm. I squeezed myself through that little hole. And I found the Prophet ﷺ inside. When he heard the Prophet ﷺ, footsteps, he said, who is it? Said Abu Huraira. Say, why are you here? He said, we were with us, we got worried, and all of the people are searching for you. And they're all behind me, behind this wall. He said, okay, take my shoes so that you cool them, they, you tell them that I'm all right. And whomever you meet, tell him if he believes in Allah, he will go to Jannah. The Jannah he will be granted admission to the Jannah. Abu Huraira took the shoes of the Prophet ﷺ, and guess what? Whom did he meet first? Sayyidina Umar. The first one, Sayyidina Umar immediately asked, whose shoes are these? He said, the Prophet's shoes. And he told me, tell whomever you meet, if he believes in Allah and he believes in the Messenger, without any doubt, he will go to the Jannah. You know what Sayyidina Umar did? <laughs> he hit Abu Huraira. He hit Abu Huraira on his chest and said, No, Umar, mashallah, tabarakallah. Gigantic. Very tall and strong. Immediately, Sayyidina Abu Huraira fell down and he cried. And he took Abu Huraira and pushed him in front of him. He said, Take me to the Prophet. He took him. He said, Oh, Prophet of Allah, see what Umar did to me. And Sayyidina Umar asked the Prophet, Oh, Prophet of Allah, did you tell Abu Huraira to inform whomever he meets and believes in Allah without any doubt that he will go to the Jannah? He said, yes. He said, don't do so, O Prophet of Allah. Don't tell the people this. Because they will become lazy and they will rely on the promise. This was Sayyidina Umar said. And the Prophet ﷺ said to Abu Huraira, don't tell them. Are you following? Now the Prophet ﷺ is saying the same thing that Sayyidina Umar when Mu'ad asked him, shall I inform the people? He said, no, lest they rely on the promise. Are you following? And today, what the Prophet ﷺ feared in this hadith, it is happening. Every Muslim, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, will go to the Jannah. True or not? Every Muslim is saying this. He's alcoholic. 
no salah, no siyam, no hijab, eating riba. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, the Prophet said, we'll go to Jannah, that's it. They misunderstand the hadith. The meaning of the hadith that you believe in Allah and you believe in the messenger, that means you follow what Allah says when the Prophet ﷺ says. That's the meaning of the hadith. It's not just lip service. Are you following? It's not that you say, Yashad Allah, 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 who said this? If this was the meaning, the kuffar, the mushriks would have said it and saved their money and saved their lives, but they refused to say it because they knew the meaning of it. Are you following? Okay. Now, do we have rights over Allah? Who are we to have rights? Who are we to have rights over Him when everything is His, right? Everything is Allah's. So how come we can have rights? We have no rights. But Allah himself, he obligated himself. He imposed on himself. And he said, you have rights over me. And that I will not punish those who die without associating partners with me. Though we have no rights over Allah. Are you following? Is this clear to everyone? Okay. Is chapter 1 clear to everyone? Any question about chapter 1? Nowadays, most of the non-Muslim people, they are not receiving dawa from the Muslims. What will be their fate? You said that they will be on fatra. No, no, no. Those people who are with us, the non-Muslims, first of all, the Muslims are responsible. Every Muslim is responsible. My dear brothers and sisters, there is a big burden and responsibility on our shoulders. The Prophet ﷺ in Hajjat al Wada, the farewell pilgrimage, he told the Sahaba on the plain of Arafat, الشاهد الغائب. Those who are present should inform those who are absent. And the Sahaba, they understood the message. And there were about 100,000 Sahabi. Handfuls they died within Arabia. The rest outside. Doing what? Taking the message, the da'wah to the people. So it is the duty of all the Muslims. Your neighbor is a non-Muslim. You have to teach him and inform him about Islam. Otherwise, in the day of resurrection, he will hold you by your neck. Say, he was my neighbor. He didn't tell me. But if we inform the people and share with them, and it's up to them, their choice, to accept or not to accept, no compulsion in religion, but they cannot have excuse on that day. Now, if there are people, no one told them anything, and this is what we call the people of Petra, then they will be tested. Allah will give them the chance. Anyone who did not receive the message, a chance will be given to him. And you know the test is very tough. So, so Allah is just. Allah said, we would not punish anyone without sending a warner. We would not punish anyone before sending any warner, any messenger. My another question is, what about those Muslims who are doing shirk? But they did not know that they are doing shirk. So what about their fate? Okay. Alhamdulillah, Muslims who committed shirk and they didn't know it is shirk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he knows their intentions. So if no one had informed them and educated them what, what they were practicing, is shirk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most just and the most kind and the most merciful. And we hope, we hope and beg him that he will forgive them. And this is up to him. Secondly, sometimes you find they are brainwashed and the mullah themselves, the maulana, the ulama themselves, they are telling them this is okay. And he is a layman. So if the Mawlana and the scholar is telling him it is okay, who will be responsible? The scholar. But the layman as well should ask. 
should try to learn, should read the Quran with understanding, and should ask the people of the knowledge. And if the people of Tawheed, they told him this is shirk and he should not do. And Allah said this and the Prophet said that. And he insisted in doing shirk, I'm afraid. He really in great danger. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide all of us. And may Allah guide all the Muslims. And may Allah make us all die on the Tawheed. Amen. Any questions? Yes. We know the paradise lies beneath the feet of the mother. But then in your talk, Sheikh, you said that kiss the feet of your mother. So is that allowed in Islam? Yeah, kissing the feet of the mother, it's okay. What's wrong with it? What is not acceptable is to bow and prostrate. But to massage the feet of your mother, kissing her feet, no problem. Al Hassan al Basri, rahimahullah, one day, he came late to the study circle. He said to the students, You know why am I late? I'm late. I was in the Jannah. I was kissing the feet of my mother. So the Jannah at the feet of the mother. Huh? Maybe someone might sometimes kiss the feet of his wife. Next question. Dear Sheikh, Allah clearly mentions in the Quran that He has not left any nation without sending a messenger. So what is Fatra? See, this is, this is called Umum Makhsus. This is, what is it? This is an usul al-fiqh, okay? That yes, all the nations, because sometimes they are pockets of human beings, isolated here and there, apart from the mainstream. So the messenger would come to the main, mainstream, and sometimes there is a gap, like between Isa and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that gap, no one came. We know that for sure at that period. So those people who lived, either they have to follow what Isa alayhi salam, for instance, if they knew about the message of Isa alayhi salam, they have to follow that message. They are supposed to follow the teachings of Isa alayhi salam. You know, the Arabs, they were upon the Hanifiyya of Ibrahim alayhi salam. That's why Hajj is there. Before Islam, there was Hajj, Umrah. They will stop fighting in the sacred months. In Muharram, no fighting. Because these are the teachings that they passed to them from their father Ibrahim alayhi salam. Because the Arabs, they were descendants of Ismail alayhi salam. Okay? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this terminology, the people of Fatra, as mentioned in the hadith, a man who he would say, Oh Allah, when your messenger came to me, I was mad. Or when your messenger came to me, I was old man. I could not understand what he was talking. So such categories of people, Allah will give them the second chance. Because Allah is just. Okay, brothers and sisters, inshallah, we will read in the coming class. Till then, fi amanillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. He created the universe To him belong the heavens and the earth The ever living, he is the first He's the owner of mercy Sent his messengers to warn his creatures of the great dangers of worshiping of the.